Do you understand the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church? It's so vital in the understanding of what went on in those days, and yet I find many people really don't know. Will you stay with me while I share with you from the book of Acts? Thank you for joining me again today. I'm finding a fascinating subject with you this week as we study the work of the Holy Spirit. And there are so many people who really don't understand the work of the Spirit or they've never been taught. In fact, it seems to me to be the one doctrine that's lacking in so many of our churches. This morning I want to share with you about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church. As we look into the book of Acts, we find very often that in our Bibles it's called the Acts of the Apostles. I believe it should be titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit, for that's really what the book tells us about. The way the Holy Spirit worked through his men, the way the Holy Spirit worked through the church as a whole, and it's just a fascinating subject. Will you stay with me? Will you share with me? And all my quotations this morning come from the book of Acts. The New Testament church was spirit-filled in every sense. And if that's true, then your church and mine need to be filled with the Holy Spirit as well. And if we're going to see that, our people have to understand who he is and what he does and the way he works. For as I said earlier this week, the Holy Spirit is the Father and Son active in you and me. The Holy Spirit is the Father and Son active within our churches. Now, first of all, let's look at the preparation for the coming of the Holy Spirit into that New Testament church to begin the work. We find the disciples received a counsel to wait from our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. And the Bible says, on one occasion while Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. That, of course, was the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you're not even to get out of Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come. And at that point, we can be quite sure that the disciples really didn't understand who the Holy Spirit was in any full sense. Jesus had taught about them, but at that point, no, it was not clear. The second thing we find is, the disciples were told that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit did come. In the same chapter, Acts 1 and verse 8, we read these words, and Jesus is speaking again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. You find that it says there, that they're going to receive power once the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Now, before we go any further, let me say this. Exactly the same is true today. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have power. We have the power of God within us. And Jesus experienced the same thing. I read to you from Acts 10 verse 38, where it says that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and went about doing good, his source of power was the Holy Spirit. Now that's true for the disciples, and it is true for you, and it's true for me. The next thing I find about the disciples, they waited in prayer and worship. We find this in verse 14. After Jesus had ascended to heaven, they returned to Jerusalem just as he told them to, and then we read these words. They all joined together continually in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now notice that sometimes we find that people don't let the women pray with the men. Well, the disciples did. That's how they were at that time. They worshipped together, they prayed together, they talked to the Lord their God. So while they were waiting, they were praying and they were worshipping. Even more than that, I believe they waited in the right place. We find this in Acts 1 and verse 13. In verse 13, it tells us this. When they arrived, they went upstairs to a room where they were staying. And those present were, and then it gives us a list of the disciples. I believe they were back in the upper room. If you remember, it was a very special place. It was in the upper room that Jesus had washed their feet. It's in the upper room that Jesus had shared the Last Supper with them. 
It's in the upper room where Jesus appeared to them on two occasions in his resurrection appearances. It was a special place, a place where God had touched them. And you know, whatever you say, there are certain places where you find yourself very close to the Lord your God. And I believe there's a right place to be and a wrong place. And this particular spot was very special for all the disciples at that point in their lives. And finally, they waited in fellowship. We find this again in the same chapter, Acts 1, verses 14 and also 21. Let's look at 14. We find there that it tells us they all joined together constantly. Or you'll find in some translations, they were all with one accord. What did that mean? They were there with one purpose in mind. They were there to wait. They were there to worship. Now that tells me a lot. I believe one of the big troubles in our churches is that lack of unity, that lack of fellowship. And because we're not one, the Holy Spirit doesn't move amongst us. He says in effect, now you get yourselves sorted out. And when you're in one and unity, I'll be back to fill you and to work amongst you. Now, the second thing I find is this. The gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And if you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2 and the opening verses. First of all, the Holy Spirit is pictured as coming as wind and fire. Let me read to you. Acts 2 verse 2. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. What does that mean? Well, I think, first of all, it means Luke, as he wrote this, is trying to describe the indescribable. How can you describe the Holy Spirit? How can you describe his coming? He says it was like wind, it was like fire. And in that we see a picture. Just like the wind, you can't see the Holy Spirit. You can't see where he's come from. You can't see where he's going to. But you can see his effect on lives. Secondly, the Holy Spirit brought new tongues. In verse 4, we find these words. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And as we continue in that chapter, we find the Holy Spirit gave them a language that other people knew, which they themselves didn't know. Well, what was this? The Holy Spirit had taken control of those men, and He was speaking through them in a unique way. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit brought courage. For in verse 14 of chapter 2, we find this. And this is Peter. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Now that to me is fascinating. Here's Peter, who only a very short time ago was scared stiff. He went away for fear of the Jews. They shut the doors. They locked the doors for fear of the Jews. And now in that same city, here's Peter standing up and he's preaching, and he's preaching Jesus, and he's risking his life. And it's only about seven weeks later, what's happened? Suddenly Peter's been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's got a new courage, and also he's got a new message. For Acts 2, 14 to 36, are his first sermon. And if you'll take the time to read it, you'll find it's the most incredible message, and the words just poured out of Peter. Why? because he had been filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had taken control of him. And when that happens, God speaks through a person, and he spoke through Peter that day with an absolutely new message. Also in that same passage, if you read it carefully, you find that he gave Peter and the other disciples a new insight into Old Testament truths, things they had never seen before. Verse 17, He's quoting from Joel and he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. That's right. Suddenly there was an outpouring of the spirit. And straight away when the spirit came upon them, there was a sign of the last days. Now, those days have not yet ended, we know. But what an outpouring of the spirit it was. The third thing I find is the work of the Holy Spirit continued in the New Testament church. He began his work there in Acts 2, and then in Acts chapter 5, I find that he purified his church. It's a fascinating passage. I mentioned it to you the other morning. 
It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you remember, they had had a piece of ground and they sold it. And they had every right to keep the money. But what they did, they brought some to the disciples and the rest they put away and kept for themselves. But they made it look as though they brought the whole gift. And what happened? Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead right there in the church and had to be taken out and buried. And it's interesting to read what the Bible says. Because right at the end of that incident, it says in verse 11, Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Can you imagine what would happen in your church? The offerings brought up on Sunday morning and suddenly someone in the church drops dead because they've been lying to the Holy Spirit. That was the work of the Spirit. Also, the Holy Spirit was given to new disciples. We find this in a number of places. Acts chapter 9 and verse 17 tells us exactly this. Let me read to you. Ananias went to the house, entered in, placing his hands on the Apostle Paul. He said, Brother Paul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. As this unknown disciple came to the Apostle Paul, he laid hands on him and immediately he was filled with the Holy Spirit. What an experience it must have been. Also, I find that the Holy Spirit inspired his men. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Here we go back in time, and we see right at the beginning of their experiences that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was standing before the Sanhedrin, the highest court of his nation. And what's he say? Rulers and elders of the people. And away he goes again. And that speech in Acts chapter 4 is absolutely magnificent. I find that the Holy Spirit directed his church. If you have a Bible, look with me at Acts 16 and verse 6. And here again, we find that Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. You might say, well, look, Lord, if they're out preaching the word, shouldn't they go everywhere? The Holy Spirit says, no, Asia's not ready yet. And he prevented them. And you know, sometimes we in the church tend to go on without being guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directed his church in those days. Now, if what I've told you is true, if the New Testament church was so taken over by the Holy Spirit, grew and prepared by the Holy Spirit, surely there are principles here for your church and for mine. And if we're working without the Holy Spirit, we see why there's no growth, we see why there's no blessing, and we need to get back to the basics. Let the Holy Spirit fill you to overflowing throughout this day, and see what happens.